diseases don't start like a light switch mm. on off. Yeah. Most diseases creep and they creep and they creep. And so you lose yourself slowly. And it's only when you get really debilitated that you go, oh, I am not right. Yeah. But it's not overnight because you you have been so busy living and these things just slowly get worse and worse. So it's really not like I had all those things overnight. It was only when they went away, I went, oh, those are really not normal. Right really had a lot of problems. I didn't recognize that I had the problems and I never complained. And I, I, I would say because I was at that point in the system, which was the 15 minute medical visit, mm-hmm. my doctors didn't have the brain space to look at me and go, severe nutritional deficiencies, father with celiac, yeah. difficulty getting pregnant. Let's test, oh, an irritable bowel. Let's test you for celiac. Yeah. Nobody really made those connections and I didn't complain about anything. Hi everyone and welcome to the Eat Real to Heal podcast. I am your host, Nicolette Richet, and I am so pleased to welcome Dr. Wendy Trubeau to our show today. Today's episode is all about how Wendy went on her own healing journey after discovering that she had a chronic degenerative disease. On today's show, Wendy will also be talking about the clinic that she opened up with her husband, who's also a physician. And this clinic known as the Five Journeys is a brand new way of doing medicine that is needed in this world. It is a membership-based wellness organization that incorporates functional medicine and a unique approach to what they consider to be the five core aspects of health, physical, chemical, emotional, spiritual, and social. And that you can complete all of these five journeys in a with a beautiful comprehensive plan for vitality and wellness. Now, On today's show, we also go beyond talking about five journeys to discuss so many topics. We're going to need three episodes just to be able to cover everything that that Wendy has to offer. We discuss preventing chronic health diseases, what are healthy vaginas, the symptoms of chronic disease, trying to get pregnant, raising healthy kids, and more. So I hope you enjoy the show. Definitely listening to the end and please share this episode with everybody that you know, because if people are out there that are suffering from a chronic disease and their existing medical doctors don't know anything about the power of food or the five journeys method for healing and recovering from these chronic degenerative diseases, they need to know individuals like Dr. Wendy Trubeau and her husband, and both physicians that are providing a whole new method of healthcare. Now, before we dive into the podcast, you know what I like to do. I like to share information on the things that we have going on through our companies, the Green Mustache and Richer Health and Richer Health Retreat Center. What's happening now is we've launched two new programs. They're amazing. One of them is our new and improved nutrition and detox coaching program that has a three-month business planning and launch component. So head on over to our website at greenmustache.com. All the links are below and definitely sign up for that program if you want to learn how to coach clients exactly as I do in using food as medicine, metabolic nutrition to reverse their chronic diseases. I will teach you everything I know and also how to launch your own business. And then of course, the second course is the, it's a three month certification program for restaurants and their chefs and their entire kitchen teams to learn how to prepare foods that heal instead of foods that harm. And so that chef training program is three months and we're going to be certifying 1200 chefs across North America and 1200 restaurants to learn about how to add menu items to their existing menus that anybody anybody is going to want to eat because they're going to be delicious. They're going to be nutritious, but beyond that, they are going to help you heal your body. So we provide some of the healthiest food on the planet. And now we're going to be showing other restaurants how to do the same. 
So sign up for those two courses. And if these programs aren't for you, no problem. Why don't you just send them along, pass on the links to people you know that are looking for a career shift, that want to add this to their existing portfolio, and you can help somebody launch a brand new business and improve their existing business. Lastly, of course, head on over to our website and watch the trailer for The Food of Our Ancestors. Our documentary will be coming out after next year as well. We have another new documentary. It's a 20-minute short doc that will be coming out in hopefully a few months. It's just going out to the film festivals right now. And once it's back, it can go live. And that is grounded in my roots. So stay tuned for that. You definitely want to go over to our website and get on the wait list for both of those documentaries because you're not going to want to miss them. Okay, everyone, see you at the end of the show. And here is Dr. Wendy Trubeau. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Eat Realty Heal podcast. I am your host, Nicolette Richet, and I am so excited to have Dr. Wendy Trubeau on our podcast today. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Great to be here. It is wonderful to have you. I love the sunshine in the background. Your book is yellow. (laughs) The flowers are yellow. I'm covered in snow here in Pemberton. So I'm craving a lot of sunshine. So I feel like you just brought that into my world today. So fake it till you become it, right? That's Amy Cuddy says. Exactly. Exactly. So we're going to be diving into a lot today because we're going to be talking about toxins and getting dirty, but maybe not too dirty. We're going to talk about potentially sex, vaginas, so many different things because you are a gynecologist, which is Mm -hmm. very exciting. Uh, Because there are a lot of women out there that are suffering from a lot of reproductive issues. They're suffering from a lot of overproduction in the vagina, not the right bacteria um, and and everything. So we can dive into that soon. But I want to get into just what made you decide to become a doctor? (laughs) Well, okay. So the formal answer is my dad's a doctor. My uncle's a doctor, my cousins are doctor, doctors, and I'm Jewish. And so basically when you're Jewish, you have three choices for career. You can go into law and I didn't think I would, I love arguing, but I just didn't think I'd be very good at the the fine print, reading the fine print, or you could go into finance or you could go into medicine and, you know, or you can go into sales maybe. So I was, but the real answer is that, so medicine was very familiar to me. It felt right. But what was really interesting was that I was in sales after college in a multimedia job. So I was going to companies and saying, oh, we'll do your slides when they still had slides and we'll, or your PowerPoint presentation or your videos. And I would sell that stuff. And in more times than I can count, people would sit me down and say, can I ask you a question about my health? (sighs) I went, you can, but you know that I'm your 22 year old sales rep for multimedia stuff. And they go, yeah, but you just seem like, you know, these things. And I, and I said, okay, the universe clearly thinks that I should be a healer. So maybe it's just my view of myself that I should alter because I kind of wanted to be in medicine, but I never thought of myself as all that smart. And so I ruled it out like, okay, I can't do that. can't do that. Okay. I'll, I'll do some sales. Cause I don't know what to do with myself. I did psychology and I, I had to really let go of this idea that I'm not who I think I am. I should listen to the universe because the universe is so powerfully saying, go be a healer. I mean, to this day, people tell me things that I'm like, why are you telling me that? I don't know. I feel like I should tell you that. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. I love that story because it is bringing tunes in my heart. And because I just found out, I asked, decided to ask my mom. I don't know why this is one question I never asked her. I was like, mom, what did you want to be? Like really, really want to be, you know, if you hadn't gotten pregnant with me at 22 and we were born in, like I was born in Africa and, you know, and she said, I want to become a medical doctor. And my jaw almost hit the ground because after I had my third baby, I actually went back and did all my pre-med sciences. So I can go into medicine because I just hit me. I was like, I want to be in medicine. I was already in the health field, but not as a doctor. So, and I can relate to everything you just said. I studied psychology. I studied everything, but medicine. And in the end, that's what I want to do. So it, um, and I think sometimes it's just in our DNA. Like it literally is just in our bones and 
yeah, we can deny it, but then eventually we have to just, just try it on for size. Yep. 100%. And it's stuck with you. And so you went into gynecology and how did that come about that you ended up huh. specializing? Well, it's so funny. My dad's an OBGYN and I, when I entered med school, I said, so let's get something clear. I'm never going to do a surgical subspecialty. So how about you just let me not do any of those rotations and I'll do the other ones on rotation. And they said, that's really, thanks for asking. Wendy, yeah. thanks for asking. That's not how it's done here. And I said, okay, okay. So I have to do those rotations. They said, yes. I was like, okay, fine. So I did surgery and OBGYN at the very end of third year because I knew I wasn't going to do either of those specialties. And so actually OBGYN was my last rotation. And I thought I, I went to med school because I was going to be a geriatrician because I love old people. I have the gift to gab. I can talk to anyone. And I actually hated it because it was so philosophically apart from where I believe, which is like, let's get to the root of the problem and let's fix it. Because by the time you're 85 years old, these issues are pretty well entrenched and it's harder to reverse. And so it didn't match with my view of life. So I was like, okay, it's not geriatrics, which I thought I was going to do. So we go through the whole third year. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. And I start my OBGYN rotation and, you know, Boston's a small town. So everyone kind of like a lot of people knew my dad and I wasn't at the hospital. He rotated at thankfully, because that would have been so anxiety provoking. So I was at a smaller Boston hospital and the, I was assigned to take care of this woman who was 19 years old, pregnant, and going to have a baby at 28 weeks. And I was doing her care and her rounding on her. And it got to the point where she was having a baby. It wasn't going to have a baby. It was like now. And I was in the room and the high risk OB said to me, he was Scottish. And he said, are you going to put your gloves on or do I need to do all the work here? And I was like, oh shit, really? Like I can do the deliveries. Like, um, if you get your gloves on. So I'm sort of fumbling my, it's like my second day. I'm fumbling my way into a gown and gloves. And I had my booties and I delivered a baby and it was like being bit with the bug yeah. because it was magical. Like it was one of those moments where I, I was like, that's it. That's who I'm going to be when I grow up, I'm going to be an OBGYN. And in as much as I thought about it, it checked all the boxes for where I was at that point. I love women. I love caring for women. Mm -hmm. Delivering babies is a privilege and a pure joy unto itself. And then the gynecology, the surgery portion of it. And then there's the office portion. So it checked all these boxes. Like I'm not going to be bored. I get to go do all kinds of cool things. I get to be with women. The boxes I forgot to check were, is it going to kill my adrenals and take yes. me into severe fatigue and full on celiac? I didn't know to check those boxes. <laughs> right. Cause you didn't know you had celiac disease at that point. I wasn't diagnosed at that point that right. I was, um, I was 28 when I did my third year rotation or 20 turning 29. And I got diagnosed with celiac when I was 35. I think I probably had it by that point, right. but the key word is diagnosed. Yes. And so I delivered a baby and that was the moment where I, I that was it. I had, I had to do that. It was like a calling. It was my calling to care for women. And Nicolette, if I can just tell you one thing that was the coolest thing, I followed that baby and that, that woman until they got discharged for, it was like three weeks. And then I never saw them again. And as we fast forward through my career, there came a point where I had chosen to leave traditional care and go into functional medicine. My husband had, and I had opened up a practice and I was leaving to go to the practice. My very last day as an obstetrician my very last patient as an obstetrician, I was doing an annual exam on a woman who was, I had never had her as a patient before. And I was like, why would they give me a new patient? My last patient. She tells me the story of how her son was born prematurely and his developmental issues. And she's now divorced and she has an ex-husband and we go, we really get into all these ways to keep her safe and resources for her son. And finally I said, I really have to do your exam. You know, you need a pap and I'm leaving and let's do your exam. So she lays down. She, and as I'm about to do her exam, she says, 
Were you ever at St. Margaret's, which is what people called the hospital I rotated through before it was bought by St. Elizabeth's, this big steward hospital thing. And I said, well, I was there when it was St. E's. And she said, I think you delivered my baby. And I, I did one of those. Oh, I said to her, you were the first baby I ever delivered. And I went into obstetrics because of you. And I'm leaving obstetrics today. Wow. And you're my last patient of the day. And it was one of those just sort of chilling full circle moments because I had had zero contact with her in the nine years wow. since I had met her. And then she, so she was the reason I went in and she was the last person I had as an obstetrician, a formal obstetrician. I mean, I'm still an OB, but wow. I don't do deliveries. And it was one of those moments that you go, okay, the universe is really, yeah. you know, I had to listen to the universe. Exactly. So I, I got into OB because of that woman. And I got to say goodbye to her before I left OB. That is an amazing story, like amazing story. Um, okay, so with so you go and you become an OB for nine years, you're doing this. And then in the meantime, you're studying functional medicine. Right. So and, in so in the middle. So yeah. there's two parts to my sort of health story. And then there's yeah. one part to the going to functional medicine. So when I, ha I had difficulty getting pregnant with my first child. Now I made up for that because I've got four children. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly didn't have any more problems, but yeah. I did have difficulty getting pregnant with my first child. And she was a severely growth restricted premature baby. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have trouble getting pregnant for the second one. But by the time the second one came, I felt awful. Okay. Uh, really head to toe, brain fog, hair loss, thyroid dis disorder, anxiety, heart palpitations, asthma, gut, bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, smelly gas. I didn't have reflux. Okay. Mm. Wasting. Get everything else. I mean, right? Like why leave something unchecked? But that was yeah. one. Wasting, joint pain, nutritional deficiencies. And by the time I was 35, I, I felt terrible. And it's only because I was, at that point, my husband was still a resident. He, he had two babies in residency. And he was still a resident. And he said, why don't you go have a consult with my mentor? Because something's not right. You know, you're just, you're kind of by the skin of your teeth holding on here. And he was right. I mean, I had no sex drive. My periods were awful. So I went to see his mentor and he did a crazy workup on me. And he diagnosed me with food sensitivities. And I remember we were in the car on the way up. We, my daughter was six weeks old, my second daughter, six weeks old, I'm 35. I'm an OBGYN. I'm working like crazy. And I said to my husband, call your mentor. I can't wait for the results. We're on the way up to see him. I couldn't wait. I said, you have to call him and tell, and tell me, is there anything really wrong? I can't, I can't cope with the anxiety of it. So he, God love him. He calls his mentor and his mentor on the phone says, you're not going to like the results. And I said, do I have diabetes? Please don't tell me I have diabetes. Like I can't cope with that. And he said, I don't know why, but sticking my fingers was the thing that I would never do. I couldn't do it. It was like to their sacred ground. So he said, no, you don't have diabetes. You have celiac. And I said, oh, my dad has celiac. And he said, well, you have celiac too. And I went, oh, and, and it was that moment that I opened my eyes to functional medicine because, you know, I've been in the system for my whole life, 35 years. Mm -hmm. And even though I learned about celiac brew, I remember learning about celiac brew in med school. Mm -hmm. And I was never tested, even though it's genetic. Yes. I never got to, I didn't know it was genetic. See, this I never is fascinating tested. to me. It's so fascinating because I know that if you were one of my clients, we would go through a full health history from your you know, conception all the way up. And, you know, we do it by the decade, or if you're young, we do it every five years. Let's talk about all the symptoms, yeah. hospitalizations, medications, you know, illnesses um, that you would had, and then that shows a pattern. And then of course, yes. we would ask about the family. I mean, but it takes an hour to do this full health history on someone, but you can learn so much. So I, I'm really fascinated but, but it just also shows you that how we're just probably so busy in our lives. We're just, you know, moving forward, getting our career started. You're having babies that sometimes we don't necessarily stop to make those connections. Like my dad has celiac. Maybe these could be from that. Right. And especially, and this is so important. I think for listeners to know that 
that's two medical doctors in one family. And it took that long to really understand this. So it makes sense why it does take so long just for anybody without a medical background to also get yeah. to the bottom of their health issues. I mean, it's really hard to treat yourself. Yes. And I never complained, Nicolette. I never complained because in residency, mm. basically we were told, unless you're dying, zip it. And so I, and because the thing I really want to highlight for your listeners is most diseases don't start like a light switch mm. on off. Yeah. Most diseases creep and they creep and they creep. And so you lose yourself slowly. And it's mm-hmm. only when you get really debilitated that you go, oh, I am not right. Yeah. But yeah. it's not overnight because you, you have been so busy living yeah. and these things just slowly get worse and worse. So yeah. it's really not like I had all those things overnight. It was only when they went away, I went, oh, shit, those yeah. are really not normal. Right. Really had a lot of problems. I didn't recognize that I had the problems and I never complained. And I, I, I would say because I was at that point in the system, which was the 15 minute medical visit, Mm -hmm. my doctors didn't have the brain space to look at me and go severe nutritional deficiencies, father with celiac difficulty getting pregnant let's test, oh, an irritable bowel, let's test you for celiac. Yeah. Nobody really made those connections. And I didn't complain about anything. Yeah. And that also, you know, that part is a piece. I always think about med school and, you know, how I would have survived it if I had gone, because I would have been going in with three kids. And, you know, that was one of the huge factors. We opened up a restaurant the same year I was applying to go into med school. And we thought we'd sell the restaurant <laughs> to pay for med school. So we didn't have to go into debt. Um, and anyway, so ended up going down the restaurant route. But it was one of those pieces because I know myself that I can just put my head down and, I can actually just talk myself out of certain things that are happening health-wise for me. And sometimes I have to make that concerted effort, write it down on a piece of paper to say, you know what, I'm going to check this out. I'm going to actually make an appointment. I'm going to do that. Like it takes a concerted effort. And so I can see easily how that could happen. Now, also one of the other pieces that I think is just really remarkable about this story is that you had an angel because of the fact that your husband had this mentor and I'm assuming he was trained in functional medicine. He's a functional med. Yeah. His, his mentor was a functional, uh, early functional medicine doctor in the Boston area. So one of the, one of the early, early founding guys who, who's been around for years. Yeah. So yeah, that was an angel right in the right place at the right time for you, because of the fact that we know a lot of people who do have Crohn's disease, celiac disease, a lot of them don't get diagnosed for a very, very, very long time because it can look like so many other things. And to have a functional medicine doctor on your team who's going to say, let's look at nutritional deficiencies, let's look at history and health symptoms and everything. That's amazing. Yeah. And I would say, if you're listening and you go, oh, could I have something like that? Okay. If you are Irish, Italian, or Jewish, in terms of your ancestry, Mm -hmm. you're genetically more likely to have a gene for celiac. So if you Mm -hmm. check one of those boxes, that's something. If you have a history of nutritional deficiencies or difficulty maintaining yourself, you know, you go, oh, I always have to take high doses of B12, or I I drift down or I need shots. That's a, that's sort of a red flag. Mm -hmm. And then if you have any gut stuff, you know, celiac can be non gut related. So if it can be a lot of stuff, it it marauds is a lot of different things. But if you have classic celiac, you'll have nutritional deficiencies. If you have osteoporosis at a young age, you should be screened for celiac. If you're checking any of those boxes, you can, you can be gluten sensitive without the autoimmune component. And that's a huge part of the population, but the, the celiac is, is autoimmune in nature and that you should absolutely be tested. If you have any of those things that you're saying, Oh, Oh, I have that. Right. Be tested. Yeah, no, this is incredibly helpful. Do you have anything on your website that would allow people to go through a checklist like that? 
Not yet, but now that you're saying that, okay. I'll design that. <laughs> I just, just a simple one pager would be really easy. People can download it and yeah. um, just to see, because I know that it is really challenging and to have a, and have a client or a patient or somebody be able to go into a doctor who might not be thinking celiac, um, yeah. you know, disease, then they, you can just present this and they can say to them, Hey, listen, I, I got this from another doctor. This is a checklist, you know, and that's the hard thing is that so many symptoms cross over to so many different chronic illnesses. So sometimes, they you know, do. you read the list and you're like, I have that, but you know, you know, we know that when people have celiac disease, it can, it can be quite serious. Um, but by Just the time this launches, the I'll have, by the time you launch this, I'll have that because <laughs> I'm writing myself a note and I'll bring this to my team, uh, like a quiz, right? Exactly. And even just what you said, you know, if you're Italian, Jewish or Irish. Yep. Yeah. Then, and this is the part where I love now medical schools are teaching um, cultural sensitivity, where it's not just looking at the individual as a collection of cells, but actually looking at individuals as being, you know, African American or, you know, any ethnicity. And we know that certain illnesses, you know, can coincide with ethnicity. So I think this is um, important training that needs to happen in med school all over, which it's starting to. Yeah. 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 Great strides. Oh, I'll get Amazing. that launched by the time this launches. So to answer your question, yes, it's on the website. <laughs> Okay, that's fantastic. Check in the quizzes section. <laughs> Great, we will drive people there. <laughs> so I want to get in. So then let, let's go. So you go to your functional medicine doctor, your husband's mentor. He says you have celiac disease. What happens to you at this point? Okay, so I was 35. That was 16 years ago. I'm 51. And oh, I was out to do the math up front. So people aren't like, wait, so okay, she sees. So I'm 51. <laughs> and I immediately went gluten-free and- Here's, here's the plug I'll put in for making a good marriage, because I said to my husband at that moment, look, if I can't eat it, I'm not serving it. I don't want to be left out at my own dinner table. There's a lot of places in this world that I'm going to be left out. My dinner table is not going to be one of them. So from this point forward, we're going to have a gluten-free home. And he said, okay. That is <laughs> it's incredible. Like, Oh, okay. Well, that was easy. You know, I didn't even think about it because, wow. because the way I always approach food in families is that, uh, I don't, I, I'm trying to, I'll try to language this in a way that's not pejorative. So mm -hmm. it's, it's whatever the lowest common denominator is. So whoever's the most restrictive is where you eat. Yes. I so you that. don't make the person who's restrictive feel left out. You feed people based on what the most restrictive person can eat. So I couldn't eat gluten, so we didn't serve it. And when one of my kids got dairy sensitive, we didn't serve dairy. So yeah. we're, we're not excluding anyone at the table. Everyone's always included. So we, I went gluten-free. And then, so I will say, Nicolette, I had gluten issues. I had gut issues and absorption issues and signs of celiac for 20 years. Wow. When I was 15, I took iron, nothing happened. It didn't help. I was anemic. It didn't respond. Then I had B12 deficiencies. I mean, I had deficiencies from the time I was a teenager. So mm -hmm. if you have nutrient deficiencies, think of celiac, but I wouldn't have been positive for celiac at 15. I was on the spectrum. I know on mm. the spectrum refers to autism, but I was on the spectrum and the spectrum goes from no symptoms at all to an autoimmune disease that, that shows up on testing, but you can be gluten sensitive without having triggered your antibodies and made the final changes in the villi and the gut. So I was on the spectrum at 15 and in my twenties, but really got the diagnosis when I was 35. I'm sure I had it for at least five years if not more. And so, I see that all the time too, is that when women decide to have babies, I mean, if you're going into pregnancy already deficient, your baby is yep. just going to like lap up everything it can get. Cause that baby is fighting to live. And so yep. you're the host and it actually can be done with you after. Um, yeah. but to get to that point. So I see that a lot of the autoimmune disorders get triggered when women uh, are pregnant or what in that first year when they're nursing and exhausted and not eating well and not sleeping well. And so it, it's very common to see that happen. Yeah. It serves as a trigger. It's yes. essentially an inciting event is, is that 
pregnancy or delivery. You know, a lot of women have traumatic deliveries. So it's a traumatic event for people. So when I got diagnosed with celiac, I went gluten-free, the house went gluten-free and we had our kids go gluten-free in the house. I hadn't really understood at that point, the significance of the genetics and what I had, Mm. because I have two genes for celiac, which means automatically all of our kids got one gene. Right. And I have both genes and one of them's a little more virulent for celiac and the other one's more virulent for autoimmune stuff. Mm. So we went gluten-free in the house. The girls, my older two still got gluten outside at preschool, that kind of thing. And then I started to untangle because getting rid of gluten didn't get rid of all my irritable bowel. It improved it, Mm -hmm. but I still had irritable bowel. I still had bloating. I still had constipation, sometimes diarrhea. The stinky gas got better. Mm -hmm. The nutritional deficiencies started to improve, but I then needed to untangle the candida issues and the nutrient deficiency issues and the adrenal issues that had happened because my adrenals, you know, don't forget I was up 36 hours in a row doing deliveries, having stressful events. Mm -hmm. And Brain-wise, I'm definitely made to be an OBGYN because it's fascinating and I love women. Constitutionally, that's not the best career because I I really should be someone in theory who doesn't work and has a whole staff of people taking care of everything. In an ideal world, that's how I would be the healthiest because I don't have the best constitution. Well, and because that sleep is going to be critical for you for regeneration, having regular sleep patterns. So it doesn't, it's not just a matter of getting eight hours sleep or seven hours of sleep a night. And with four kids, I mean, who's getting that, right? And so you have that on top of a career that's very demanding. And I think you've said two really important things that I just want to um, repeat here for our listeners. And one is understanding the career and the lifestyle that matches your constitution. Mm -hmm. Some people might refer to it, you know, you can do personality tests that actually will highlight your constitution and get it probably pretty accurately to what, you know, somebody like yourself or another medical doctor might actually, you know, design as it, you know, state is your constitution. Another piece that I really loved, and I just want to bring this back is eating to the lowest common denominator. And I love that because it sounds bad, right? <laughs> it doesn't sound bad because, you know, we're only as healthy, I find, as the, the weakest member, the sickest member in, in our too. society, right? Yes. And so, but the thing is that sickest member has the most to teach you because they're most likely, they're going to have to eat the cleanest foods. They're going to have to eat the healthiest. They're going to get rid of the dairy and the gluten. And, you know, and then you're going to be eating that way. And so just by default, you're going to get healthier than you could have ever imagined. Yep. I love it. So it's actually the way to go. Cause I have a lot of clients too, that one member is sick. And then the rest of the family members are like, I'm not eating that stuff. And I'm like, maybe you know, you guys are all living a very similar lifestyle. Why don't you just give it a try and send love to that person who needs it, right? You're yeah. showing love by saying, I'm going to eat those same foods as you are. Yeah. I always language it like we would do f- that for you. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to do that for them. And no yeah. person gets left out and nobody deserves to be left out at their own table. Yeah. Look, there's a big world out there. There's a lot of ways you're going to be left out, but not at your own table. Yeah. With your own family. That's huge. And as a woman making that claim, because we know a lot of moms can be like, you know, put their health on hold for their family, but it's so important. We put the oxygen mask on ourselves. And Mm -hmm. then when mama's happy and healthy, everyone's happy and healthy. I always use the, the card that I say to women when I, you know, some women will just get the value and do it. But some women need that extra push. And the extra push is I pull this card out of my car, my back pocket. And I say, so you have kids, right? Yes. How do you want them to treat themselves? Mm. Because you're role modeling for them, how they're going to, how you role model is how they're going to treat themselves. So if you can role model, self-care is important. Setting boundaries is important and value valuing yourself as high priority events, your children will model those behaviors. So what do you want your kids to model? And that usually gets women to go, oh my God, there's an opportunity there, right? To level up. Yeah. And so if not for you, then for your children is really the motto to, because of course, from, and I only came to this 
very late. I mean, a couple of years ago and my youngest is turning 10. So all my kids were already born and starting to grow up by the time I realized, God, if I'm not cared for, ain't nobody cared for. Yeah. But you have a whole nother life to model this for your children, which is yes. so amazing, right? I feel the same way. I'm only just learning that now. I don't know if you have to get that space when your kids are a little bit older and not needing you like 24 seven. And then all of a sudden you can put, you, you know, put that love back on. And I wouldn't even know how to, you know, how that resonates. And I asked the audience that like any new moms out there in your twenties and thirties, and you're hearing this and you're like, not possible. Like what she just said, but it yeah. is possible. You can do it. And, and you can start now just in little ways. Yeah. I would say it's not like you're going to flick the switch and all of a sudden build a new life. It's more yeah. like in the course of your day, instead of doing your laundry or folding your laundry or washing your dishes, take a few minutes and take a break, mm -hmm. take a rest. Yeah. If, if the, if the little people are down, take a break, read a book, take a nap, step outside, listen to a meditation, because I promise you the dirty dishes and laundry will be there. Yeah. It will be there. Yeah, and two-year-olds love nothing more than to help you. So yeah. let them help because obviously when you have a baby, they don't help, but yeah. leaning on your spouse and leaning on your family and leaning on the babies when they get old enough, it's so meaningful because yeah. you don't have to do it all. So I have another project for you, and that's just to write a wonderful parenting book for new moms all about self-care. <laughs> so you just assign that to your team to get you to, you know, write that book. <laughs> I'll put it on those. Our next book is, we just signed, we're signing the contract today to write our next book, which is on menopause. Amazing. So, because I'm, you know, it's all about me, right? It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I'm in the transition. And one day I was sitting in the car, I'm having a hot flash and my husband talked to me. And I looked at him and I said, do you have a death wish? Like I'm in the midst of a hot flash. What are you doing? Just ixnay on whatever conversation a you think we should be having a because it's not happening. Let me finish the hot flash. And then I said to him, God, I'm so sweaty and bitchy. We really need to write a book about this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but that so that's, is... the book. <laughs> that's the next book we're writing all about oh. how to how to not do as I did and tear your husband's head off and tell him he has a death wish, but really to navigate the perimenopause in a graceful yeah. fashion without mm. losing your body, your mind, or your relationships that's coming next. Amazing. So anyway, that's next <laughs> on the list. And then, you know, probably a new mom's guidebook that can be on the list. When, when your kids start having babies, you can write that book. That'll be yes. perfect timing. Yes. Yeah, but right. I'm happy you're writing this menopause, menopause book now because I'm going to need it. I can feel that like I'm about three yeah. or four years away, potentially. Right. It's coming. Yeah, it's it's coming. coming for you. Oh yeah. Probably even <laughs> faster than that. I bet. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So let's, yeah. so let's get back into your journey. Um, yes. So you are now seeing this functional medicine doctor. You are you have a plan, like this doctor's writing a plan for you or what yeah. is happening? Is there solutions? He's like, he's like, take some supplements. Don't eat gluten. Bananas, you're also allergic to. Don't eat those. And, you know, I'll see you later. And I was like, okay. But, I, you know, the, the good news is I had all the data yeah. and I had my husband. And so I saw him, I think, two more times. And at that point, so that was 2005 and then in 2007 or eight, by that point, I was like, I got to do this. I, my husband had already opened the practice right. and it was down the street from my OBGYN practice. And it was just burning my butt that I could not help the patients the way I wanted to. So the funniest one ever was a patient who's now his patient, but she started as my patient. And we used to call it vaginitis Fridays because <laughs> the itch that you dealt with all the time by Friday, you were like my husband, boyfriend, partner, spouse, whatever, they're coming home and I need to have sex with them this weekend. And I'm too itchy. So we call it vaginitis Fridays. So this woman comes in for vaginitis Fridays. She's got this itch and God, we see each other every freaking week for like two months. And finally I said to her, Kelly, I think you have a gluten issue where I pulled this from. I said, I think you should go see my husband. He's literally practicing down the street. And I think you should go see him because I think you have a gluten issue, but I don't really have the tools to do the workup. And 
I have 15 minutes with you. I can't do this. Right. So she's so funny. She's Irish off the boat. She looks at me. She goes, hmm, beer or sex? I'll think about it. <laughs> but she did go see my husband and he diagnosed her with celiac. And she then turned around and diagnosed her entire family in Ireland with celiac. Wow. And she went off gluten, stopped the beer. And I never, she never came back to see me for vaginitis again. Wow. And, you know, I saw her, I see her periodically when she comes to see my husband and I'm like, so no more. And she's like, no, what do I need you for? He cured me. <laughs> so that, that was one of those moments where I was like, I really want to do that for people. And yeah. there's a lot of people out there who also have good hands and can do deliveries Yeah. because I was starting to come down into the checking the box of wrecking my health for someone's else, mm -hmm. someone else's health, no longer no longer qualifies as a good excuse. Yeah. And so how do we put those, how do we put my needs parallel to my need to contribute? Yeah. And one of our old business directors used to say like, don't get attached to what vehicle you're using, be attached to the bigger thing. So mm -hmm. the vehicle was OBGYN. And so when I sort of stepped away and said, I really want to contribute by getting to the root cause of what's going on for people, just the way my husband's mentor did for me mm -hmm. and allowed me to start transforming my health. That's what I want to do for people. It's called functional medicine. That means I need to go get more training and I'm going to transition out of doing deliveries and surgery because there's a lot of people who can do that, but there's not a lot of people who can do the root cause analysis and, and, and the, the way I can be with people. Yeah. That's, that's not as common. Well, so I just I love that that whole experience happened to you because of the fact that it brought you down that path. I love that you stayed open to it as well. Um, and because we need people who are open to that. And, you know, you're definitely someone who says, okay, there's signs coming from everywhere. Let's just, you know, go down that route. You're not resisting, you're surrendering to it, which mm -hmm. I love. And I think it's important that more doctors do move into functional medicine with the heart that you have as well. And that mindset that you really truly wanna help people because I know, you know, when, and this is for patients who are looking for a functional medicine doctor, I think it's important to find the ones that are not just gonna have functional medicine as their title, but not actually truly practicing it because I've seen yeah. that happen. And so, and, and so, and, and this is not to offend any physicians out there, you know, having worked with thousands of clients around the globe, I do see, and work, working with physicians, I do see the difference. So what are some questions that patients can ask a functional medicine doctor, just to be sure that they are working with somebody whose best interest is to actually see like the ver reversal, the elimination, the total healing. You use the word cure. I never use that word, but I love that you use that or that the, you said that woman used that with your husband, but that's ultimately our aim is to be symptom free or to yeah. be able to live your life fully with lots of energy and lots of health. Yeah, hundred percent. So I, th I think it starts with look at the reviews, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, Dr. Google is not your friend. Yeah. Don't use Dr. Google. If you're like, do I have cancer? Cause Dr. Google is going to tell you, you have cancer and you're going to freak. Yeah. So yeah. don't use Dr. Google for that. But when you're looking at, is this practice a good match for me? Use Dr. Google because look at the reviews. Mm -hmm. Do people talk about the connection they had with that person? Because certainly for a surgeon, you're going to be sleeping for most of the time. It, their personality does not really matter. What matters is how steady are their hands and yeah. how good are their outcomes. Yeah. But for someone who's going to be your diagnostic cheerleader coach, you need to have a good working relationship with them. So if it's important for you that you have someone of a certain gender, honor that. Mm -hmm. Look at the reviews. What's their staff like? And so we, we, we called our company five journeys. I remember when we were trying to figure out the name, I was like, it's like journeys health. And our, our approach is predicated on that. There are five core areas of health and they meld together to make your full health. Mm -hmm. And that's your physical body, your chemistry. That's where the functional medicine lies. Yeah your emotional status. That's how, what are you saying to yourself, your relationship with yourself, mm. then your social 
health, that's you and your community, and then your spiritual health. And for some people that's religious and for others, it's what's their purpose in life. Mm -hmm. So you put those all together and that's your health. And what, we're, so I'm lying on the acupuncture table and I'm like, sort of, that sort of creative time. Like I'm sort of thinking through what's the name, what's the name. And then I went, oh, five journeys. Ooh. It's five journeys because it's not just journeys. It's five journeys. And we've gotten some pushback. Like, how can you take five journeys at once? I'm like, well, you can't, mm -hmm. you can take two or three at once, but five is too many. Don't take five. It's overwhelming. But what we're looking at is all of those things that go into your health. And so I would say when you're looking for a provider, some people need just data mm -hmm. and they're going to go and make the changes. So if you don't need to resonate and have a relationship with, and you're just looking sort of a one-off, it doesn't really matter. Go for a functional medicine provider. Anyone will do. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for someone who's going to be with you for multiple stages of life and guide you through, you really need someone you're going to resonate with. Yeah. And that's when it's important to say, okay, how am I going to navigate this in a way? And you, you know, you might have to kiss some frogs before you find the prince, <laughs> Yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> Whenever I go clothes shopping, they're like, you're returning all of that. And I'm like, I kiss a lot of frogs. <laughs> yes. I kiss a lot of frogs. Sometimes it's not a match and it's okay if it's not a match. Yeah. Sometimes I say to patients, I'm really not the doctor for you. Right. I'm not the doctor. I'm not going to be good with you. I, you're not going to like me. Yeah. Let me send you to this person. You're going to like them more. Because not every exactly. doctor and every patient is a good sort of puzzle fit. So yeah. look for someone who you really feel is good for you, resonates, speaks your language, challenges you, and has the data. Yeah. And then stick with them. I love that. And it just what you said about the five journeys, somebody who knows and believes that there are multiple facets to your health, that it's not yeah. just one of those five. And maybe you're just working on one out of the five right now, but it's important to address, to address all of those, whether it's, you know, in this, well, hopefully in this lifetime, Yeah. but in well, and around important. whatever you're seeing. Yeah. You, it's really hard to address all of them at once. Yeah. And I would say like, for myself, I'm clear what my purpose in life is. Mm -hmm. So that's almost never something that I check in with. I mean, when I'm perimenopausal, occasionally I check in with, am I in the right marriage? Cause he's talking to me while I'm having a hot, <laughs> <laughs> <Don't tell me. laughs> the poor guy, right? He's so nice. So, but so there's some things that you can kind of set and forget, get mm -hmm. in an exercise routine, move your body regularly. You got the physical. You know, yeah. make sure your posture is good. Make sure you're stretching and move and sweating. Cool. Check it off. Yeah. And then the social, emotional and, and chemical are often more iterative processes because mm -hmm. you never just say, okay, I fixed my B12 and then you go, okay, now what? Yeah. That's iterative. What's next? Yeah. What's next? Yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's beautiful. And yeah. And a lot of people are looking for the one pill wonder, the one hit wonder, but there is no one hit wonder. It really mm -hmm. is, you know, exactly what you said. We have multiple stages of our life. We're going to go through menopause. Then we're going to go through being a 70 year old. that might need just a little extra protein than maybe what you were used to, or maybe, you know, you're going to find, you know, yeah. a whole host of other things. And so we yeah. want somebody to, that we can go to and that they understand you're at also at different stages of your life. This is brilliant. So I want to get into your book because your book, Dirty Girl, I haven't <laughs> read girl. it yet. I was hoping <laughs> I'd be able to get my hands on a copy before the interview, but I am going to definitely have this on our shelf. Um, and, and let's get into that because there must have been a leap that took place when you moved over into functional medicine. And what are the things that you yeah. started seeing? Yeah, so, so the celiac story is like part one. Mm -hmm. And I then spent like nine years working on my gut and my adrenals. And in that time, I did do an evaluation for heavy metals, but because it was only one point above the cutoff, mm -hmm. I actually discarded the result. I don't mean I threw it out. I just said, oh, well, I don't really need to focus on that. I just kind of did the work up as a, let's just check all the boxes. Right. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I, I started to do more testing and treatment on my patients. And then, and then it really sort of came home because I had two major chemical exposures in a nine month period. <clears throat> my neighbor took his house down mm. because he wanted to build a new house. 
and it was a post-war house. And I freaked. I was like, shit, close the windows, turn off the air conditioning. And it was like hot. My family's yelling at me. I'm like, it's a, it's, it's got lead in the house yeah. and we're downwind. It's dusting us. Yeah. And my hair loss started to creep up after the house. And I was, and everyone kind of was like, Wendy, I think you're crazy. I'm like, no, I swear my hair loss is, is, is worse. And my hairdresser was like, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. And, um, I was like, it's not fine. I have more hair loss. I swear I have more hair loss, but because you have a lot of hair, it takes a while to see it. And then that was in September. And then in April of 2019, we went to France. It was like the trip of a lifetime. We went to France and it was 10 days after Notre Dame burned and we were slogging. It was so dusty. We're slogging through all this dust. And I was like, God, I'm going to have to wash everything. This is going to suck washing all the sneakers and all the clothes because so dusty. And about a month after I came back from France, I started to lose my hair much faster, mm-hmm. like really noticeably faster. And I gained nine pounds, which I have never met a woman, a healthy woman who's like, oh, let's gain nine pounds this month, yeah. kind of overnight. And I developed a rash on my face that I, I just, I was like, God, these seasonal allergies are killing me this year. You know, it started right around mm-hmm. my nose. Then it went down to my chin. And then what really got me was it was <clears throat> on my eyelids and, you know, my eyes were all red and my face was, I was like, Jesus. And, um, I started to do the functional medicine workup and I was like, what is this? What is this? What is this? And then like four months later in August, NPR did a report and I happened to hear it that said that when Notre Dame burned, 500 tons of lead got released into the air. And the closer you were to Notre Dame, the higher the exposure. And then it concentrically got less the farther you were away. And I was like, I I, I was there. I was there. And then I started to piece it together and go, oh, wait, okay weight gain, hair loss, rash, exposure, exposure back in September. Shit, I have metals. So I did the test and my lead went from nine to 12 and we treat over eight, but that was a pretty clear increase. And so I started treatment in October of 2019. So we're just over two years from where I started treatment. And I already knew about mycotoxins because someone had offered a free kit. So I did the kit and I was like, oh, I got mycotoxins too. So I'm like working on those. And then the last straw was when I did the environmental toxins, pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, plastics, gasoline, all that stuff. I did that and had a whole bunch of those positive. And I'm holding my report and I look at my husband and I go, I'm such a dirty girl. (laughs) I had a few expletives in there. <laughs> yep. And, I, and then I said to him, oh, we got to write that book. Yes. That's the book we got to write because I've spent now, I mean, all these years working on my health. Yeah. We eat organic. I work out. I'm like, you know, like the poster child for healthy living. And I have all these toxins. Now I have shitty detox. Mm -hmm. I had terrible stress. I had celiac, which exacerbates, you know, my body was busy doing other things, but, um, that was the impetus for really now putting it all together. And, and so that, that was what caused us to write the book because it impacts all of us and we're exposed in so many ways that a lot of times until I started to drill into it, I never really thought about, oh, beds have flame retardants in them. And that's a thyroid disruptor. So if you've got some thyroid issues, then you probably want to look at whether you're sleeping in a flame retardant sprayed bed. And pajamas. Pajamas, furniture. Yep. Carpet. All of it. All All of it. Curtains. Yep. All of it. So it, it just sort of snowballs, but because people are lying on the bed, it's really uh, in your face. Yeah. So that was something that I started to just peel off. You know, yeah. we, we had not had a bed with flame retardants in it for over 10 years. So thank God. I also don't have a thyroid issue anymore. So yeah. since I dealt with the celiac, it's kind of cool. So this is a lot, I know there's is, a lot to unpack. No, but this is really important for people to understand because there's books out there that are, you know, get dirty, right? We want to get dirty. So people need to understand there's a difference between the books out there that are saying get dirty. They're talking about 
allow yourself to be exposed to, you know, viruses that are not dirt. going to take you down, dirt, bacteria, like it is, you know, we don't need to be afraid of those no. things. Um, and, it, and we don't want to be sanitizing everything that's right. going to kill our microbiome. But at the same time, though, there are toxic chemicals and pollutants out there that when those bioaccumulate in our body and our body, like you said, and I want to get back to this, if your body has a shitty detox system, which you can find out genetically, whether your body does as well, there's genetic tests that show that. So I'd love to just get your input on that, but it's just important. It's really important because I think a lot of people are walking around, breathing in the air, you know, touching things, tearing down their asbestos laden houses and their lead laden houses and not thinking about how those, you know, micro particles are, are getting into your system and what's happening. And I just want to share one story about that. I lived in a turn of the century house and it had paint all over the, um, the trim around the windows on the bay window. And so when I saw that, I was like, I'm taking that out. So I sat there with <laughs> a heat gun for two weeks and oh. scraping lead because I was 21 at the time. I didn't know. And I scraped and all the, the paint particles were falling onto my lap. I was wearing jean shorts, skin exposed, oh. no mask. Oh. And I can tell you how fast th this happens. So because of that, all of a sudden, at one point, about two weeks in, all the nerves in my legs started tingling and I looked down at my thighs and my, they were spasming, like my skin was spasming entirely because I was sitting on my knees, it was landing there on my lap. And then I started to notice a whole host of other symptoms. And then a friend of mine said, what the hell are you doing, Nikki? Like that's lead paint. There was like layers that thick. And so it happens quickly it just takes one or two yeah. exposures and I also have a shitty detox system genetically that's what my DNA says so this totally makes sense and then yeah. I was you know massive loads of it so can right. we get back to the when you said that about yourself your shitty detox system now yes. is this something you would test for when you're doing functional <clears throat> medicine with your patients Yes and no. Okay. Yeah. I, got, <laughs> so, I just wanted to get to it. <laughs> so I love data I would say I call myself a data hog and so if people are game for doing, doing genetics, I love to do genetics. I do love doing genetics outside the system. And what I mean by that is things are evolving still and healthcare is not a right. Healthcare is a right and it's not something you're guaranteed to have. So I never want someone to be discriminated against based on their genetic results. Right. So I, and I always, you know, I, I always encourage people to do it outside the system. And what I mean by that is 23andMe or Ancestry.com to do it in a place that's not connected to the system. Mm -hmm. I would do that. You can always go into the system and get testing. So I have a friend whose family member carried the BRCA gene, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is the breast cancer gene. And they were wondering whether they might have it. And I said, okay, first of all, go get your life insurance, go get your disability yeah. insurance, like go get your insurance lined up and then go get your testing out of the system. If it's negative, great, no harm, no foul. If it's positive, then that will serve as the moment for you to say, okay, I want to get into the system because you now need additional testing. Yeah. And so to be smart about it, because they could discriminate against you for life or health insurance if you go without coverage. Exactly. So there's, there's ways in which you can be discriminated against. So yes, I love doing it. And you have to, to be do smart it. about it. Yeah, you have to be really smart. That's a really good point as well. Um, we use uh, DNA Power, and then there's another one out of the University of Toronto in Canada, um, Mutual Genomics. And those two have been really great. And they're very extensive because they actually look at your lifestyle and your exercise and your food and everything. And they'll sit with you and discuss like, okay, well, it's not just the data that's handed to you. It's actually like, what can we do about it? Yeah. And which I find is very helpful as well. But I think those, that point that you made is really important. You need to understand your insurance system and um, which is probably going to be different with every company. So just look into that first. Yeah. So I love yeah. getting the data and I'm not attached to it because I mean, you, you can sort of drill down into it and go, okay, you have an autoimmune disease you feel like crap and your testing is positive. You have shitty detox. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you can, you can kind of look at someone and go, I can pretty much guarantee there's the toxins involved here. Yeah. yeah. Something's going on. 
Yeah, no, and, and that's true. I mean, and you see these patterns over and over and over again with people, especially like you said, you had been eating well, eating organic, mm -hmm. you had been treating your body well, but then meanwhile, you have these symptoms. And that's often a sign because some people, you know, are going to show up and they've never eaten a vegetable. Like I have clients that literally have never eaten a vegetable. I'm like, let's just start with that. Or let's just start yeah. with trying to go to bed and get more than four hours sleep a night. Or, you know, sometimes those things are a very quick fix because your brain's detoxing while you sleep, which is yes. phenomenal. So when you did this, so then once you get these results back, you went through and you started to detox your body. Did you start to support your body in that? Yeah. So let me say one thing about this, Nicolette, because you just brought up an amazing point that's really like earth shattering, but people might have missed it, which is detox is what I'll call a higher order level behavior. Mm -hmm. So detox doesn't occur when your body is in fight, flight, or freeze or survival. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't addressed, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. If you haven't addressed your safety, your security, your sleep, your movement, you have to do what I'll call the platform behaviors. You have to eat properly, not too much, not too often, not, not too much alcohol. You need to sleep enough for your body. And most people need somewhere between seven and nine hours in bed in order to get the amount of sleep they need. Mm -hmm. You need to move your body in a meaningful fashion so that you break a sweat five times a week. And you, uh, particularly for women, you need to lift weights so that you can be strong as you age because mm -hmm. we lose muscle mass as we age. And you need to not be a stress ball and not be participating in toxic relationships. Yeah. So if any of those are really blatantly out of whack, you're not going to detox because what's right. happening is your adrenals are clicked into survival, mm -hmm. fight, flight, or freeze. And it's saying to the liver, guys, we need some quick sugar here. Don't do your detoxing. Don't do anything. Just focus on survival. Your gut shuts down digestion. You focus, you raise your blood sugars. You have this whole cascade of things. A great book to, for people to read is Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky, mm -hmm. because it really drills into how, how does that happen? You know, that's a, the, he explains it beautifully. He's wicked smart. So he's great to read. And so you can't do detox when your liver is diverted to survival. Right. And you just highlighted that. But I really wanted to underscore that because it, it's not going to happen without without dealing with the platform. So, okay. Mm. So now when you get to detox first, get the data, you're going to have to work with a functional medicine provider because you got to get the testing. Yeah. And then the, it falls into different categories. There's the metals and the ones you really care about are mold and mercury. There's the mycotoxins and there's a ton of them. So you want to care about the nasty ones. And then there's the environmental toxicants, pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, plastics. There's that. So I think of them as three separate categories. And the reason I do that is that the mycotoxins are treated one way, the metals are treated one way, and there's some overflow into the environmental toxins and pesticides from the metals treatment that we use. And but that's its own treatment. So you figure out what you have, right, what's going on. And then how am I potentially getting exposed? What, what is that? What's filling up the pump? Yeah. Stop filling the pump. Yeah. Okay. Right? And then let's drain it. And that's with you know, all the things. So supplements, medicines, sauna, Epsom salt baths, yeah. the, all the things that improve detox IVs. And um, what's really interesting. I have a patient, I tested her glyphosate glyphosate is the most commonly used herbicide in the world. Yeah. And it's also what people use on their lawn so that they have those beautiful lawns. So if you have a landscaper, they're probably spraying that on your yard and you're walking on it. It's an endocrine disruptor. It disrupts the microbiome. It's associated with a number of tumors and it's everywhere. So amazingly, mine was low. Like I didn't have glyphosate, but this patient who lives a super healthy lifestyle, I mean, she's just like another poster child, her level was 3.8 and it should be under 0.38. And I was like, Jenny, where are you getting this? She's like, I don't know. She said, I think everyone must have that. I said, I disagree. 
because I don't have it and I am terrible detox. So I just talked to her this week and she said to me, you know, I wonder if it's from milk because I drink raw milk. Mm. And what comes up here is it's really sometimes hard to figure out the source, but she drinks raw milk from farms that are next to farms that spray. So her cows that she's drinking the milk from might be getting glyphosate because of drift. Exactly. It's not that the farmer is spraying, but the farmer next to the farmer is spraying because glyphosate will drift. Yeah. And so it can, it's contaminated all of the chickpeas in the United States, no matter what, they're all contaminated. Yeah. And then, okay, I'll just address this up front. Someone, one of my patients called me after the book came out and said, hummus, my kid eats hummus every day. I said, let your kid eat hummus. Yeah. It's good for them. Yeah. You know, like hummus or chips. Yeah. Go for the hummus. Yeah. And the but hummus will it. help. Yeah. And the hummus will help yeah. with detox. But it's a whole food. It's a real food. There's lots of fiber in there. So fiber. yeah, it's this careful balance, right? Between knowing the source and thinking what the source is. Cause I do see people who will quickly be like, it's gotta be from that. And there are ways to test it. And one way to, you know, that I say, look at your work environment, right? because this is important, because see if there's been any changes made, if there's renovations, if there's new products brought in, you know, you can check for that. Then you can check in your house as well and and see where it potentially is coming from. And then of course you can check your cosmetics, you know, you can check your fridges and your cupboards. There's a lot of places, but the part about the glyphosate that I just really had to want to highlight is I was just in New York just before COVID broke out teaching a group of healthcare practitioners um, how to use food as medicine, how to restore nutritional deficiencies, um, our Eat Real to Heal program. And I brought up the topic of glyphosate and not one single one of them knew what glyphosate was. And here. (laughs) Exactly. And so this is, I just want to come back to, if you want to find a doctor, find a doctor who cares about toxins in the environment and who maybe knows what glyphosate is or, and, you know, just some of the leading things that you talked about, because I know that is one of the things where it's like, oh, don't worry about the mold. You have nothing to be concerned about, but mold is a serious issue. Glyphosate is a serious issue. I wrote the pesticide policy for Whistler on glyphosate to get our municipality to stop using it when I worked in government. And it is, I saw all the health Canada reports and it is a very, very serious issue. And so you want to find someone who just has the knowledge of that and is willing to talk to you about that as well. It's important. And I was shocked that people did not know about, I was like, oh yeah, there's still work to be done. I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, We were just talking to someone who was talking about breast implants. And she said that, Mm -hmm. that before breast implants were FDA approved, they didn't have any data on their safety and they still don't have it because the companies just haven't done the long-term follow-ups. And so there's a lot of things that we, I would say, trust the government to have handled thinking, oh, they wouldn't allow that if it weren't unsafe, but there are, there are a lot of things out there that are unsafe and aren't regulated. And the companies may not have your best interests at heart. So it's up to you to, you know, I'll, I'll give an example. I grew up my house. We used simple green. And I don't know if you have that up in Canada, but it's, it's a cleaner. And my mom said to me when I was a kid, this is so great. It's so clean. It's really good for the world. It's, it's great cleaner. And I was like, and it's a great cleaner. I said, okay, I have used simple green since I was a child into, into my adult life, into up to about three months ago or six months ago, I think it was, I went simple green is not clean. Simple green is not clean. And I, I'm hoping that they don't feel like I'm bashing them. I don't mean to bash them. Yeah. It's simply that the brand I was using and didn't think about. The thing to highlight is it's really easy to get in a rut of things that you don't think about. And then you mm-hmm. wake up and go, I don't think I would choose that today. Yeah. So what I would say is as something runs out, your face products, your lotion, Look it up on environmentalworkinggroup.org, ewg.org. Look it up. 
they'll tell you if it's safe. And if it's not safe, that's an opportunity to level up. Yeah. And it's, that's where I'm talking about the constant process improvement because little changes over the course of a year add up to a huge, huge. change at the end. Yeah. And if you look at it at the beginning of the year, like, oh, by the end of the year, I'm going to have gotten rid of all my beauty products and all of my house cleaning products and changed out some of my furniture that I'm doing and changed my clothes, you would feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So you don't think of it like that. You think of it like as something goes out, I'm going to level up. Mm -hmm. And, and so when I woke up to that, I went, oh, okay. I went to my, my boyfriend and I have two boyfriends, environmental working group and Amazon. <laughs> They're really good to me. <laughs> And my husband is very supportive. All, they give you everything you need, the information, the gifts. It's awesome. <laughs> and my husband's really, he's like, I like those boyfriends for you. Those are good boyfriends. Oh, I love this. I'm <laughs> going to use that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Going to my boyfriend. So my boyfriends give me everything yeah. I need. They keep me safe and they keep my house stocked. Yeah. So anyway, so you just want to level up slowly as you go, yeah. be, be kind to yourself. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. And if you're like me, you'll screw it up because yeah. you're human. Last time I checked, you're human. Yeah. So the, the trick is not to not be human. It's to have grace for your humanity and see, think yeah. it's funny. Like that moment when I went, oh, I, I was like, how could I have missed that? And then I went, because it's a rel it's, it's really a relic from my childhood. It's, it's yeah. a, a holdover, right? Oh, and of course. It reminds me of it. But it's like that with food as well. So many people yep. hang on to food because they're like, oh, I used to eat this with my family and there's an emotional attachment to it. And sometimes I think often you can ask yourself, like, am I hanging on to this? Because if it's, is it an emotional attachment? And yep. then going back to, you know, serving your highest self, what do I want for my family? What role model do I want to be? You know, you want to be a role model that is looking into the products that you have in your house and, and saying, you know what? Yeah. This product might smell good. It might look nice. It might have a green label on it, but you don't want to be, you know, I don't want to say a sucker to the greenwashing, but a lot of us are because they're marketing the amount of marketing that these companies spend on making their product look green when it's actually not. I mean, they spend millions of dollars yeah. so that you just have to walk down the shelf grab it because the bottle looks like it's right. a green, it's in a compostable packaging, it has a leaf on it. And then at the end of the day, it's not really that much different than a lot of other chemical products out there. I got snookered by that actually for our cleaning products. I was all excited. Oh my God. It's so, it was, it is good for the earth. Yeah. It just wasn't as good for us. Right. Yeah. So the, the bad, the trick is how do we find something that's good for us and good for the earth? Because mm -hmm. I don't think that they're in competition. Yeah. I think that we're, we really need to get back to what's good for the earth and is good for us. It's in partnership. Yeah. So I often say, use it if you could eat it. If you'd want to eat that, then, you know, clean your house with that. Like it's, mm -hmm. you know, and it just, it just makes it a little bit easier to make decisions. Sometimes instead of getting overwhelmed by like, you know, where do I go? Or until you hook up with your boyfriend, environmental working group, yes. you know? Yeah. My kids came in the house, God, 10 years ago, my daughter, they gave my daughter some blue, it was blue, bright blue. She came in with it. And she said, can I drink this? And I said, what's in it? Yeah. Just to try to not to be the evil parent who is like, hell no, what's in it, sweetheart. So she starts, she goes, I can't read that. So we start, I couldn't even read it. I said, I don't think that this is food, honey. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't think we should be eating something that we can't pronounce. She was like, well, that makes sense. I said, why don't we pour this down the drain and recycle the bottle? She goes, okay, yeah. done. That's a really beautiful way of doing it because you are teaching them the skill, which is not to just say, what's the right answer. It's actually to go find the answer for themselves and have that experience of, for example, not being able to pronounce the ingredients on a label and, you know, and also to be able to make the choice that, you know what, because I know for myself, I'm like, oh, I don't want to waste that. But at the end of the day, I also don't want to use my body as a trash can. So yeah, yeah. it's a really, it's, um, it's funny. I, um, I think I've alluded to that I'm Jewish and we tend to be very neurotic about food and God bless my mother. She was not neurotic about food. I don't know how she didn't get it, but she was, you know, we're typically like, if you don't eat, I'm going to be sick and you got to eat a lot. <laughs> like, 
and, and I made that, so you should eat it. I'm sure kind of all the, all the cultures are like, well, that's not just Judaism. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> all the cultures. <laughs> Why aren't you eating that? Someone yeah. said to me recently, it's just literally this weekend, we were away at a conference and someone said to me, it's just a bite. They served, I didn't eat it. They served donuts with a banana. Is bananas foster on top of donuts? The donuts were not gluten-free. And, the, and one of my co-people sitting at the table said, well, can't you just have a bite? I said, I'd wind up in the hospital if I did that. Yeah. And he's like, just from a bite? I said, dude, I'm thrown off by just scraping my finger on yeah. it if I, if I ingested that. Yeah. So that's the amount that will throw a celiac off and you want me to take a bite? No way. But so even now there's, there's peer pressure everywhere. Yeah. And the trick is like, how do you navigate it in a way that doesn't kill them off? And just is like, yeah, no, I, I'm really not fancying a hospital visit. And yeah. by the way, my, my asthma went away when I got rid of gluten. And that mm -hmm. was one of the early ways I could tell if I got a gluten exposure, I'd get bitchy and I got an asthma attack. <laughs> but you're not kidding. When our bodies are triggered and our immune system is triggered, the very yeah. First thing I find that's consistent around all my clients, myself, my family is your attitude shifts. Yep. You become irritable. You don't want to like, you, you don't want people in your space or, you know, you just want to like crawl into somebody's bosom, you know, but there's a massive shift in attitude. And this is something yep. people need to be pay attention to. If you're snap it, snapping at the barista, you know, check in with yourself and just be like, could, could I be potentially, you know, my immune system is a little bit hyperactive right now, but I yeah. think that that's an important first, first sign. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's still now I get irritable when I get a gluten exposure, Yeah, uh, irritable and this faint headache, yeah. not a real headache, just like, Oh, do I have a headache? I think yeah. I have a headache, that kind of thing. Those are my two poker tells right. now when I, I don't eat out that often, but when I do, those are my two poker tells that I watch for happens within a half hour of eating. Mm -hmm. And then it's followed by the GI stuff. And then I tend to be okay. But yeah. And these warning signs, I think is another really important point because everybody is going to have a different trigger, right? They're going to have a mm -hmm. different mild symptom that pops up. And I always say, don't shoot the messenger. Listen to the messenger. Mine is my vagina. We'll just get <laughs> A little bit. We haven't talked about vaginas. We haven't I talked. Have. We're going to talk about vaginas. I had to bring. <laughs> but yeah, vaginas because, you know, it, it, it'll just be like, oh, I haven't had a yeast infection in years because I've really changed my lifestyle. But yep. it'll just be a slight like, is that an itch? You know, right. what's going on down there? Exactly. And I stop immediately. I'm like, okay, yeah. I'm going to make sure I get my sleep, clean up my diet. I'm going to drink lots of water. I'm going to, you know, all the, the foundational yeah. pieces need to go into place. And everybody has that smile, mild symptom. You just got to figure out what it is. And then you just got to listen to it because your body is talking to you. Yeah. hundred percent. Right? And, and unfortunately for some people like myself, we didn't pay attention to yeah. the early signs. And then it, here's the next concept, which is how bad is it? Is it bad enough yet? Yeah. Right? right. And so some people either because they weren't paying attention or because philosophically it's not bad enough. Right. You got to wait till it's bad enough. Yeah. You know, and, and I wasn't really thinking of it like that. Cause that doesn't match my philosophy. I'm like, let's just deal with problems. Mm -hmm. However, however, I wasn't paying attention to my body. I just literally was checked out. Yeah. I was very busy parenting, working, surviving. Mm -hmm. Like so many of us are. And, you know, and it doesn't have to be, you know, spending hours and hours and hours a day, right? Like mm -hmm. once you hear this, what you are saying to people, you're sharing such amazing gifts with them. You could just start doing this tonight when you're laying in bed, do a body scan, right? Yeah. Think about like the little things that came up that day for you in your body. And then maybe just take note of it because this is where I find you don't have to go to a, da a doctor to get data right? You can collect data on your own and be like, well, it's actually been six months of my lower back really hurting, or it's been six months of this ongoing little tickle in my vagina. That's not a good tickle, you know, like it, it's it not could, from my vibrator. It's no, exactly. I'm like off. <laughs> exactly. Or that slight little headache. And then you just take note of that every day. It takes you a couple seconds a day to do that. And you'll start to see that you've collected enough data to show you there's something probably going on that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I always say that pretty much every part of your body should be invisible to you. Mm. So your gut should be as invisible as your elbow. 
Mm-hmm. People don't, pe- nobody comes in. Well, I'm a gyne- gynecologist, so people never come in complaining about their elbow. But if I were a Jeep, G- G- but, but I kind of go head to toe, anything hurt, blah, blah, blah. Nobody's ever like, yeah, that. People are like, <laughs> south of the border is really bothering me. Not normal. Okay. Yeah. So it should be invisible. All right. of that. You, know, you shouldn't, ha- headaches are not normal and they're not a deficiency of Tylenol. Yeah. No, exactly. It makes it worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So can you, okay. So I want to get into what's contained in your book. So we're going to do that. Cause I feel like I can talk to you for hours. There's so you know, many, could, you and I have a good, like a lot of similar things too. So yes, this, I'm so happy we're chatting and yeah, we should talk about the book. Okay. Well, we should talk about the book, but can Seriously. we just dive into, let's dive into the vagina. Okay. No yes. pun intended. Let's just do it because you are a gynecologist. So what yeah. are some of the common things that you are seeing in women? And I love that you said, it's not normal. So what are these things that women should not be living with that they are living with daily, trying to treat daily over the counter stuff? Okay. So let's go back up a step. Any, anything that your body interprets as toxic is something that you have too much of. Mm -hmm. It could be food. It could be partying. It could be alcohol. It could be sugar. It can be toxicants like metals, mycotoxins, environmental pesticides, all that. So for the vagina, the vagina is essentially the mirror for the gut. So whenever someone comes in and they've got discharge, discomfort, itching, burn, smell, recurrent yeast infections, recurrent BV, all of that to me is the warning barometer that the gut's out of whack. Mm. That's all it is. It's one of those, I go, okay, your gut's out of whack. Cool. You have a food sensitivity. Maybe there's some dysbiotic bacteria. Maybe you don't have enough of the good guys. Maybe there's some yeast in the gut, but basically the vagina is going to do what the gut's doing. Mm -hmm. And women always go, but my vagina, I'm like, we're going to get there. I promise. I promise. I'm going to fix your vagina, but we got to go upstream because it's the vagina is the barometer. It's not the determinant. It's, it's the responder and not the, not the driver. So it's a passenger. That's what it is. Yeah. So whenever the vagina is out of whack, I'm looking upstream because it's a passenger. And then other things women can deal with are you know, anywhere in the menstrual cycle. So bad periods, heavy periods, too frequent periods, uh, painful cysts. You, know, you should have cysts. Let's get clear. You should have cysts because if you don't make a cyst, you don't make that, you don't ovulate, which means you can't get pregnant. So it's a good thing to have cysts, but you shouldn't have a ton of them at multiple times throughout the month and they should go away and then come back every month. So right. they, they're they cyclical. They don't want to be and, the kind of cysts that are growing, growing, growing. Yeah. yeah. No, those are not normal. They shouldn't yeah. have anything except water in them. They shouldn't have their cysts that kind of have like bone and teeth. And those are pretty gross. Hopefully you don't have those. They're called so a dermoid, but those aren't normal. Those need to come out. Yeah. So anything in the menstrual cycle that's abnormal can be a barometer for, Hey, something's going on here. Mm -hmm. If you have difficult transitions, PMS, if you're thrown off by your periods, all of those can be barometers that indicate that something else is going on. You know, we're looking up at the gut and the rest of the system, the adrenals, the thyroid, those will throw off the periods and then transition infertility or impaired fertility. I just really despise the word infertility because it implies something about women that I'm not willing to get to. I'm like, you're fertile. We just haven't figured out why you're not getting pregnant. Exactly. You're gonna I love pregnant. that. Thank you for saying that, yeah. especially because women can get pregnant once we heal these systems that yes. really basically cause our reproductive system to be like, maybe we should not be making a baby right now. So your body is really wise and it yes. will make it difficult for you to get pregnant if the other systems are not in, in health. Yeah. But it really, I mean, when you're bit by that bug, Mm -hmm. it is powerful. So I I mean, I will, it's funny. Women will come to me and say, I want to get pregnant in three months. I'm like, great. And they say, well, can you get rid of my toxins? I'm like, hell no. Right. It takes way longer than three months. If you've been bitten by the bug, go have a baby Yeah. because not because denying it is, is a painful experience for women. So Mm. If they're bitten, go do it. And we'll, the, I promise you the toxins will be there. Yeah. <laughs> <Going anywhere. laughs> yeah, totally. No, that's a good point too. And just for, you know, women who are listening to this, 
you know, anyone who's listening to this, any gender, if you have friends, family that, you know, want to have babies in the next, let's say, however long, tomorrow in the next five, 10 years, you know, just, just start now, start now with cleaning up your system, start now with reading dirty girl, applying what you're saying, because you want to give your body the, you know, the best opportunity to be the beautiful host for that next baby that's going to enter the world. So start now. Yes. A hundred percent. And let's talk about, the, okay. So the book, you asked me to talk about it yes. and then I went off on some tangent about the vagina, but okay. No, but this is, I love what you said about that too, because it reminded me just of a book that I want to share with people that it's called living downstream by Sandra Stein Grabber, amazing mm-hmm. biologist, but she talks about, you know, look upstream and let's look at where all the toxins are coming from. In her case, there are environmental pollutants coming from literally up the valley upstream mm-hmm. of your town or your community or state. Mm-hmm. But you know, this concept, you can apply it to your own body, like you did, like your vagina, your mouth, your ears, you know, your skin can be the downstream, you know, effect of what's going on upstream. So let's get to the root cause. So I think that's 100%. just huge, huge, huge. But yeah, yeah, let's dive into your book. For sure, okay. because I want people to know what your book is going to entail. I know they're going to want to go out and buy it, um, but let's dive into that. Perfect. I love. I so I. It was a blast writing this book because, I mean, you know, it's all about me, right? Like, <laughs> you get to you get to be completely self centered, but it's really about taking all of the things that I was suffering with and putting it into a roadmap of mm. how do you figure out what's going on for you. How do you address the potential areas that you aren't even aware that you're being exposed for toxins? How do you do those things in a way that's not going to make you nuts? Because one thing I'll say is, so uh, when, if you've listened to the interview and then you read the book, you go, oh God, it sounds like her. Well, cause it is, it's me. So when the, the most important thing is I started this process already having worked on the basics, Mm. the food, the sleep, the exercise, the relationships, the making sure that my relationship with myself is healthy. I did, I've been doing this work. I'm 51. I've been doing a lot of this work for years. And so if depending on where you're entering this, this dance, it can feel a little bit overwhelming because you know you go where do you start so the book is a roadmap for walking you through where do you start start with food always start with food because what you want to do is level up what are you putting in you like you said if you're not eating vegetables eat vegetables if you don't okay so you're not going to go from eating no vegetables to eating 100% plant based organic that is not a realistic pathway what you're going to do is level up incrementally. You go, okay, I'm not eating any vegetables. Let's add some vegetables that are cooked into the food I'm already eating so that they're kind of invisible, but I know they're there. And then let's try those same vegetables, either less cooked or raw out of the dish. Like I'm thinking hamburgers or meatloaf. Those are great ways to incorporate vegetables. I'm sorry, carrots, onions, celery, ground up in little pieces. It adds flavor. It adds texture. And that's a way to get it in. And then you go, okay, maybe I'll add a slice of, uh, not a slice, a piece of kale as part of my hamburger thing. So you start to add it in slow ways. I do recommend people work with nutritionists because Mm -hmm. this is way outside of my, my wheelhouse. I mean, I can do it, but I think that nutritionists are expert at it. They're going to do so much better than I am. So really working with a nutritionist is going to be very meaningful for people who are eating zero vegetables. You're going to want to work with someone. Yeah. Okay. And then food is huge. And so once you've leveled up on your food, then the next level is, okay, can I make it cleaner? Grass-fed, organic, grass-finished, no pesticides, Mm -hmm. local if possible. We always debate, you know, what's better, local versus organic? Because- we go back to what's good for the earth is if it's got pesticides, you got to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But if it's local, it's not destroying the earth. So there's some, there's some ebb and flow there on, on what's best and you'll make your own choices, right? The uh, most ideal would be local and organic, Organic. but you can't always get that. I live in Boston. You said there's snow where you are and there's no snow, but it's cold. There's nothing growing. 
Yeah, no, and it's and it is one of those things too that get out there and develop relationships with farmers. Like if you are used to hopping on a plane and going to Hawaii for a vacation, you might want to do a staycation where you travel around and visit the local farms, you know, just outside of the city that you live or in your community yeah. and get to know your farmers and then start asking them questions. And you'll find out that a lot of foods store well into the winter. They're willing to deliver it to you. There's CSA boxes. There's, you know, you'll find that there's actually a lot of food within close proximity to you, even if you're in a cold climate and the farmers are already doing the work for you. You just need to get to know them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we bought uh, two seasons ago, we bought a cow for the first time and it came pre-packaged. So people are like, you bought a cow? Did you have to, I was like, no, it came in packages labeled, but we called the cow Bessie. I don't know if that's really her name, but we called her Bessie. And Good name we, for a cow. And, and it's the best tasting meat I've ever had. Right. And it's, it's markedly different. Yeah. And so we're at my, my farmer actually emailed me today saying, Hey, you ready for more? And I was like, yeah, bring it yeah. on. And that's the best relationship for farmers as well is when they can sell direct to consumer, it's better for them. You know, you form those relations. You can even ask farmers to grow things for you. We have a collection of plant-based whole food restaurants that are, you could walk in there there's no gluten in there whatsoever. You can eat every dessert on the menu. It's only made from whole foods, no refined products whatsoever. And so when you, um, but we had to do that. Like we formed relationships with the farmers and they grow, you know, rows and rows and rows and rows of stuff for us. But if yeah. we hadn't asked them to, I mean, they wouldn't have done it. So right. you, they're willing to help you meet your needs because that's what farmers love doing. They love growing, growing products. Growing food that you'll eat. Yeah. And that's the goal. Yeah. They're excited by that. So don't be afraid to ask. Yeah. Yeah. So I always recommend people start with food because that's something you do two to five times a day, depending on what you do. And food's really critical for your health and, and can both help you not fill the pump of toxins. And if you eat foods that will increase phase two in your liver, it can also help you detox from toxins. Yeah. So that's it's food is food's the platform. Yeah. That's amazing. And then we go through what are the things that you're putting on your body? What kind of products? What, what are your beauty products? What are you cleaning your, and then, and then the third category is what are things that are around your body? That's the things you're cleaning your house with, the scents you're using, perfumes, the furniture you're on, what you're spraying your yard with, what paints are you using when you, when you clean your house? All of these things make a difference. Yeah. And so the book kind of systematically walks you through what do you do? What, what can you do here? What can you do here? What are possible ways you might recognize that you're being exposed? What are some top tips? Every mm-hmm. chapter has the hot top picks, top things to focus on. And yeah. then at the end of the book, we put it all together and we give you a checklist. And so it's really about how do you transform your life? And again, it can feel overwhelming. So mm-hmm. go slowly don't try to do it all overnight. Just take one thing at a time. One of the, one of the moms I'm in the carpool with fig, found out we wrote the book. She goes, okay, I'm reading it. I ordered it. I'm reading it. I'm on the part about stress. Ooh. Someday I'm going to be like you and our mutual friend. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm totally, I totally stress too. I just work on it because I'm going to meditate every day someday. I'm like, you have a three-year-old and a five-year-old and two other older children. Yeah. Of course you have a lot on your plate. So yeah. it's like, be nice to yourself. Yeah. I think that's one of the most important things that I'm learning how to do. I understand the concept. Do I practice it every single day? Hell no, but it does start with the thoughts first. And that's a really important place to detox is, is those thoughts. And then, and it can, that part can happen quickly, right? If you're used to constantly having negative thoughts, you all, it's just a practice of really switching the language, hearing it, switching it over something positive. And even with your book, for example, you know, I imagine myself 20 years ago, if I were to read this book when I was first learning about toxins in our environment, you know, I could, you know, I'd feel myself almost panicked to the point of paralysis, like, yeah, and we don't want you getting scared of your environment. Your environment is beautiful and your body is also very resilient and your body just needs a little bit of extra help. If you are somebody who has a shitty detox system or somebody who lives in a more toxic environment and can't afford to move, you know, or end that relationship tomorrow, but you can start with your mind because that is such a powerful place. And like you said, just to bring it around to that, just so people remember if your body is in constant fight or flight, Mm -hmm. then your body's not going to detox 
you know, it's going to make it harder for your body to detox. So starting with the mind too is so important. Yeah. And you, you really highlight something that's so important because you can have a thought. Let's, let's hypothetically say, oh my God, I'm going to see my ex here. Mm -hmm. And that thought sets off a chain of chemical and hormonal events in your adrenals that puts you into fight, flight, or freeze yeah. that shuts down your detox, promote, shuts down digestion and promotes survival. Mm -hmm. Just from a thought, whether you see your ex or not is not relevant. It's that fear that you've just created. And so you might see your ex, you know, so, so the, the, the things I'm always looking for, are how, what are the ways we can empower your thought process? So mm. I, I'm so happy you brought this up because especially as women, when I, I feel like I didn't have anxiety until I had kids. Mm. And then all I could think about was like, what could happen? What could happen? What could happen? Right. And those thoughts are super disempowering. So I would say, any thought that starts with what if is a thought that we want to transform into something else. And there's, there's basically two paths we can take. One path is what would I do if my patient said to me, I have two mm. autistic sons. I'm going away for the weekend. What if they burn the house down? I said, Michelle, that is not the right question. The question yeah. is there's two parts, right? what would I do if they burn the house down? Mm -hmm. And the other question is, what do I need to do to prevent them from burning the house down? Ooh. What are they, because your brain loves to think about things and do your brain loves action. Yeah. And so what you do is you give your brain a question it can answer. Right. When you ask the what if question, your brain goes down into powerlessness and victimization yeah. because there's no answer to what if. And my fifth grade teacher in elementary school, Jack Chagru, used to say to me, what if a big pink elephant comes and sits on you? Yeah. And I was like, uh, I don't know. He's like, well, stop asking what if questions. Yeah. I never internalized that lesson until about five years ago. But what if questions have no power because they don't give you access to a, a behavior? Yeah. But what would I do if or what do I need to do to prevent if so are very valuable questions to ask, because that gives your brain access to behavior. And then you go back in the driver's seat and you're no longer a victim of your fear. Mm. Right. I would be like, what if my seven, I have a 17 year old. She drives. Yeah. Mine too. <laughs> 17 right? years old. We'll just start driving. It's terrifying. Oh, so yeah. the question is not, what if she gets in a car accident? This, she's going to get in a car accident. Yeah. She's 17. The odds are good, right? Yeah. Totally. So that's not the question. The question is, what do I need to do to keep her safe? What do I need to do to maximize her chance of surviving a car accident and yeah. not killing anyone else? Yeah. Those are the things. Yeah. So that entails don't text and drive. Yeah. And here's why, and here's how to avoid it and making sure that her Bluetooth is hooked up and making sure that people aren't, you know, God, my teenagers love to be like, look at this. I'm like, I'm driving. I'm driving. Yeah. My kids do I am that driving. all the time. <laughs> right. So, so to teach their friends not to do that so that they yeah. don't look. So yeah. to the, the tips and tricks to keep her safe so that I'm not like, it, so I'm not worried about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I did find myself going down that. What if she gets that? What if, what, you know, and then I was like, okay, no, 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 no. We're not doing this. Yeah. We're going to do another conversation. Cause that one, I don't really want to be in the, what if conversation It's super disempowering. Yeah. To your kids as well. Like I know I can go down that route to all, you know, and as a parent, yeah. sometimes when we're so busy and we're not thinking and, and we'll use that disempowering language. And again, be kind to yourself, right? If you're listening to this now and you re realize that you do that, be kind to yourself. That's okay. That's all the past. It's what are you going to do now with this yeah. new information, these brilliant questions, what would you do? And you can also apply that to yourself in all areas of life like as you start to age and you know your friends are you know getting diagnosed with conditions and I see this happen a lot people start to get very fearful you know when their family members get sick and then they're like what if I get cancer what if I get this what if I get that and as opposed to well well how, what could I do to prevent that so I'm, and also what would I do if I love this. You know, yeah. I find a functional medicine doctor. I find an amazing team. I put together a list of, you know, putting all these foundational pieces in place and yeah. which one do I do first? So it's just, that is a, I, I, you know, this whole podcast has been brilliant, but I say that this piece is like a gold nugget that you can take and put in your pocket 
and whip it out it's every free. single day. Yeah. I mean, the magic is that transformation occurs in a moment. Yeah. Humanity is always present. You're always going to go down the path of what if, because we're human, right? Yeah. So you're going to go down that path. And so the trick isn't, the, the, the gold isn't in being perfect. Yeah. That's not the goal. I mean, maybe that's the goal, but the goal <laughs> want to be perfect. <laughs> Me <But> too. <laughs> that's not the goal. The goal is not perfection. The goal mm-hmm. is minimizing the time that you're off the rails. Yeah. And so that goes for the way you eat, the way you think, the way you treat your body, the way you treat others, because we're all going to have those moments we're not proud of. Mm-hmm. And, and so there are going to be times you're going to go to a party and you're going to eat something that you know you're not going to feel good about after. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. The goal is not to not do that. The goal is to go, okay, I'm going to get back right back on my program yeah. tomorrow or later, later today. It's so that you don't make yourself wrong for the rest of the month. Like, oh, well, I yeah. did that. I'm so bad and wrong. And then you eat your way to more, more solace and depression yeah. and it snowballs. So it's just to have it, get back on your plan. Yeah. Which have comes it, back to that. Yourself. Yeah, that kindness, that self-love, the yeah. letting go, the yeah, this is all, this is all incredible. Can I ask you um, if you have a spiritual practice, or is, are there some really good mentors out there that you have, or is it more religious? Or yeah, it's really interesting. Um, we right before we opened Five Journeys, we did a meditation course. It was a week long course, and it was really amazing because it taught us how to meditate. Mm. And from that, they offered a coach. And so this was six years ago and they offered a coach and I signed up for the coach and I failed. And <laughs> I failed fail I fail at I, meditation. I totally failed because I, I, I kept meeting with him. I was like, I don't, I don't get it. I can't get there. I don't get it. I'm not, it's not happening. And he looked at me one day, he goes, look, it's not for lack of trying but you are too tired to meditate. Mm. I can't teach you. You need to prioritize rest. And six years ago, this, this happened. And that was the, what, that was the moment where I went, Oh shit. Like what got me there wasn't going to get me where I wanted to be because I wanted to be someone who altered the world And I needed to take better care of myself, even though I was pretty well cared for, I still hadn't yet prioritized what my body needed. Mm -hmm. It was years out of OB at this point. So six years ago, he said to me, I can't teach you. Mm. And I interpreted that to mean like I failed. Yeah. I didn't really fail, but like I couldn't meditate. I was not well enough. I was not rested enough. So I have been on a mission for the last six years to prioritize rest. And I think that the pandemic has been really difficult for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I would say that's been so valuable is that I've been able to get more sleep. Mm -hmm. And so I went from getting seven hours in bed a night to getting actually nine hours in bed a night. And that, that difference has been transformative. So when you go back to my spiritual practice, I haven't yet gone back to meditating. Mm. Uh, I, I am trying to see, but, but there's been something that's made a difference for me. And I, I really think it's around my, a couple of things. One, my system isn't so jacked up. Yeah. I'm not in fight, flight, or freeze all the time. I'm no longer exhausted. Look, I have two businesses, a new book, a husband, four, four kids, kids local in-laws and a full panel of patients. So there's a lot of different ways that I'm being asked of Mm -hmm. and I'm no longer as frayed as I used to be. I certainly get frayed. I mean, look, there's a lot going on. So I've been thinking about that recently because I've noticed I'm less reactive when my husband says things that tick me off. I'm not like, wow, I'm just like, (laughs) So let's talk about that. Yeah. And so I think that my spiritual practice, what I would say is my practice is that I've been practicing not being reactive. And now the acts, the absence of not being reactive, isn't the presence of being lovely. Right. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so, 
<laughs> I've also actively been practicing. How do I be that person who's lovely yeah. consistently so that it becomes a practice? So that it becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. And so there are some, I, I've noticed some times where I've noticed that instead of being a royal bitch, I said something that I was pretty proud of saying. Mm. And so I would say my spiritual practice is to be a lovely human being and take the times that I would react and have the space to take a deep breath and look for A, what are they really saying? And B, how do I respond in a way that moves the needle forward? Mm -hmm. I want to love... be someone who meditates, but I'm, I'm not yet. Well, I love... Yeah, I love your complete response there. And to me, that's exactly what I want to say. Your spiritual practice is just knowing yourself, knowing what you need, being, you know, aware of your behaviors in your community, in your family. And that in itself ultimately is, I mean, every book on anything I've ever read that is whether it's spirituality or, or, you know, meditation or, you know, yogic philosophy, or it doesn't matter what it is at the end of the day, it's, they say it's to know yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's That's to be kind. Part. Yeah. And it is right. the hardest part is to know yourself, but in doing that, you get to give yourself what you need. And in your case, it wasn't meditation. It was yeah sleep and then through that you are serving the world in such a beautiful way because you realize that you also want to lean into love with those people around you and what greater gift what's what greater spiritual gift is there to give than you know giving love to people and I'm just learning this about myself as I'm learning you know figuring out myself and knowing myself but you know I have a wonderful coach and he just said you know, and I said, wow, and being really patient with my husband. And he said, you know what patience is? Patience is love, you know, mm -hmm. and it was just so lovely because I was like, right, I, I move in and out of meditation and meditation is not just sitting cross-legged on the floor in front of your candles, right? It's, um, can, it can look like so many different things. Same thing with yoga. Mm -hmm. doesn't have to happen on a mat. It actually can happen every single day around you. It's in the words mm -hmm. that you speak. It's in giving yourself what you need. It's giving other people what they need. Um, if you can do that, et cetera, et cetera. So I just think that was a, a beautiful response. Thank you. Sometimes my husband meditates every day. Mm -hmm. And I think, oh, that dreaded should, I should do that. Yeah. And then I think, no, I shouldn't do that. That's not where I am right now. Yeah. He yeah. should do that because he yeah. loves it. Yeah. And you're writing a book and you start being of service to the world by, yeah. you know, sharing your knowledge through your direct experience and your, you know, all of the research that you've done and, and which is just incredible. Thank you. Um, I know that earlier we had talked about a wonderful gift that you'd like to give our audience yes. beyond yes. just writing your book and your time here today on our show <laughs> and sharing your insights. I feel like we need to definitely do another one of these because there are so many areas that I'd love to go deeper on with south you. South of the border, right? Yes, all south of the border <laughs> stuff. Let's dive Let's talk into about the sex. Dive. Oh, yeah. And that is another important area that I, I definitely would love to chat about with you with. Yeah. Obviously, that's going to require another two hours. But women can have a healthy sex life. And 100%. 100%. And it's there. And I know you have beautiful insights. That, so I will have to do that in another podcast. But what is this gift that you'd like to give our viewers? Okay, so we talked about how overwhelming it can feel to level up. And as we were writing the book, we recognized that this is going to create a huge gap for people because you got all this knowledge of what you should do and then not knowledge of how to do it. So we created a companion guide for the book, mm. which is a healthy living detox guide, which is how do you level up in your life? How do you level up your cookware? How do you level up your makeup? Mm. What are the things you're going to do? And it's free. It's more, we sell it normally, but we really feel like, how do we get the word out? How do we get people in the game. So for listeners of your podcast, we give it away. And it's, so it's fivejourneys.com, F-I-V-E-J-O-U-R-N-E-Y-S.com forward slash promo, P-R-O-M-O. -O. You'll need to put your, your email in and then we send you the guide and it's a PDF awesome. format. So you can look through it at your leisure. And I think they actually put the links in so you can go, you know, we recommend scan pans, you go right to scan pan, because we did all the work. So you don't have to because we know, we did this ourselves. We know how overwhelming it can be. 
That is amazing. And that is the piece that I find needs to accompany documentaries, needs to accompany books. It's the, how do I get started now? Because people mm -hmm. will want to get started and we don't want them just putting the book down and jumping to the next book and the next book. Right. And when you can do this, this is when we actually get results because people can put it into action. So this is an yeah. amazing gift and people just, just do it. Download the document, just do it, start today. Because for my clients, usually they have to hit rock bottom before they come bad to enough, me. enough, right? The bad yeah. enough moment. We don't want you hitting that bad enough no. moment. We want you actually being an inspiration for your families and for your community members. And you can do that starting right now. Just little changes every day, being kind to yourself and just learning, being willing to learn more and be curious and ask questions. I would second that. Wow. Okay. And how can people find you? You already said you have a full practice. And so what do we do with these people who want a doctor like you? Where do they find you first? And then where can they go for more help? Perfect. So I do see patients. I have a full practice and, and we're continuing to grow. So I do still take people in and I have other people in my practice whom they can see who we, we train. So okay, they, good. you get like, you get the Wendy Trubo without waiting for Wendy Trubo. <laughs> So our practice is fivejourneys.com. I know, right? Oh, thank goodness. So fivejourneys.com is our website and you can schedule an intake call if you want to learn more and, and you're not committing to anything. It's just more informational call. And then we have Instagram. We have both five journeys health, which is our Instagram for the company. And then there's Wendy Trubo, which is my Instagram where I posted that I met Terry Walls last week. And I was like, hashtag starstruck. Cause he's I'm my hero. <laughs> I was like, Terry Walls. So yes. anyway, so that's my personal one. And then we have a Facebook page, five journeys and we have LinkedIn five journeys everywhere. Five journeys is pretty much us. That is amazing. Yeah. And for anybody who doesn't know who Dr. Terry Walls is, please go back. I don't remember which episodes that were, but we did two episodes with Dr. Terry Walls. Do you know someone with MS or, I mean, actually any host of chronic yeah, illnesses? Autoimmune. Yeah, exactly. Definitely follow her incredible yeah. stories in her work. They're doing just yeah, amazing, amazing things. Yeah. Amazing. amazing. I have a feeling then, you and I have the same superheroes. <laughs> yes, totally. 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 <laughs> yeah. And then the books on sale, either on our website or at Amazon, either way you can find dirty girl. If you just type in dirty girl, you're going to get something that's not related to toxins just for the record. So you want to type in either dirty girl book or dirty girl toxins or dirty girl Trubo with my last name, something to narrow down your search. Cause otherwise you're going to get things that may or may not be what you're looking for. <laughs> the same thing happened to us when we were coming up the name for the restaurant because it's the green mustache but if you put in other colors before mustache it, does, it takes you down a very interesting road so yeah. yeah same same thing so okay that's good we'll have the links in the show notes for sure for all of our listeners Wendy there's so much more I'd love to get into with you but we are going to do definitely another podcast on vaginas on sex and dive in even more to share your definitely. beautiful insights in all areas spiritual health definitely. mental health physical health everything family health relationship health you really cover it all so thank you for being on our show Nicolette thanks for having me here this has been great yeah, this is, this went by fast, mm -hmm. fast, too fast for me, but yeah, we're going to get, so I'll let you get back to your incredible, wonderful life. And mm -hmm. I just wish you so much wellness for you, your family and your community. Thank and you. To you. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. You know what to do. Share this incredible episode that we just did with Dr. Trubo and pass that on to your friends. Head on over to our website and sign up for all the beautiful programs that we have. There is no better time than to really get started on working on your health, prioritizing your health so you can reverse your chronic degenerative diseases, so you can reverse your illnesses, and you can create ample amounts of energy, ample amounts of um, freedom in your body so that you can liberate yourself and go out there and accomplish all the things that you want to do with that newfound energy. So get started today. Thanks everyone. See you on next week's episode of the Eat Realty Heal podcast. Bye-bye.